This is John News Prime. Our headlines tonight will take you to the Central Business District, where traders and road users are incensed over what they say is the neglect of roads in the area. A desperate move to save what is left of a fast eroding community as contractors begin work on a temporary sea defense at Glyphe to mitigate the impact of devastating waves. We'll hear from authorities as three more houses are destroyed in just 24 hours. Also tonight, offense will gain in notoriety as an enclave for Sakawa boys. We'll hear from the chief of offense who has tagged security officials to find ways of dealing with the menace. Called all the security heads in the municipality to a meeting at the palace we discussed this particular issue and they promised to take action. Also here on Joining News Prime, a committee's report exonerates the work of Love FM journalist Erastos Asaridonko as it finds its findings relied on substantially his evidence and Joining video uh, submitted to the committee. Meanwhile, the family has described the report as nebulous and politically engineered. We are of the view that the report is fabricated, is nebulous, and is needless. My name is Ernest Mina, and joining us Prime is live on DSTV channel 421 Go TV 144. This is your home of independence, fearless, and credible journalism. Stay tuned in. Hello again, many thanks for joining us. Traders and road users in Accra's busiest market, Makola, are incensed over what they say is neglect of roads in the area. It is the city center of Ghana's capital with hundreds of business activities operating around structures that were famous symbols for commerce in Ghana after independence. But some of the people who work from there say it is a pale shadow of its former self. Johnny says Justice Bedu has been there. The famous UTC building, once a signature monument of busy life in downtown Accra. Now abandoned and in ruins, it still towers over the city's central business district. The commercial life hasn't changed though. A chunk of Accra's business activity still happens here. And yet the road network is run down. There are gaping potholes when you are driving from the UTC area heading up to the central post office. Drivers and traders are the ones feeling the pinch the most. Modern 25 years old, crowd now. Now, a car way fat more than eight years in as we say. I have driven in Accra for more than 25 years. This is where all the AMA buildings are, and yet all the roads are bad. Just a few minutes away from here is the office of the mayor, and look at the roads. If the government won't fix the roads for us, they should come and plant plantain trees on it for us. We don't have plantain in Accra. If they want to fix the roads, they should plant plantain trees for us. This road is like a dam. I think this is our share of government's one village, one dam. When it rains, this place floods. And when the sun comes out, it's extremely dusty. We are chased for tools and levies. And you look at where we sell from. The trotter drivers here are also suffering because of the road. Our cars are always breaking down. Elizabeth Oforiwa has been selling by this heavy pothole for years. 
She says the bad roads slow down business and put their life at risk. Across hustle and bustle happens from dawn to dusk every day. But the rough roads here remain a headache for those whose lives depend on it. Justice Beidou, Joy News, Accra. Sekwe, omu nye maya ya, ondi omu jyo bodi osu maya. If you cross a crowd, you get bored in the bank. If you saw a crowd, you get bored in the bank. If you saw a crowd, you get bored in the bank. If you saw a crowd, you get bored in the bank. If you saw a crowd, you get bored in there's a desperate move by contractors working on the Dansuma and Sea Defense Project to save what is left of a fast eroding coastal community of Glyphe, which has been at the mercy of violent sea waves. Last week, about seven houses collapsed as a result of the devastating sea erosion in the area, exposing the only health facility as next in line. The Ministry of Works and Housing had hinted it will dispatch a team to assess the situation by Thursday. But in just the past 24 hours, three more houses have collapsed, leaving more residents displaced. We'll hear from the MC for Ablik Mawes shortly. But first, my colleague Manuel Kranti, who reported the situation earlier, went back to Glyphe and here's his report. The people here are left distressed and, uh, you know, stranded. For most of them, they are having to loiter around, spend the night in the open air at the mercy of the weather. Themselves, their children, their wives, or even husbands all together. <laughs> She's been telling me that they've been living here for about eight years or so and that the sea has taken down their house and so now she lives in a store which is right ahead of this particular point and and, and she she lives there and this lady also has um, a, a baby of an obilene obilena for months obilena for months of an obilene 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 for months of so she's been telling me that they have to, you know, uh, put up a tent uh, to pass the night at the mercy of the weather. Together with this uh, baby she's holding, a four-month-old baby. Um, just in the past couple of minutes that we arrived here, there's, um, you know, uh, an excavator that uh, is carrying some of the rocks and then uh, some of the polders and putting them just across the shoreline, something the semblance of um, a temporary, uh, you know, protection for them. At this side of town, um, the women, the children, really are the ones who are bearing the brunt of the waves. Let me speak to uh, some of the gentlemen who are here and gathering around. Main reason why every brother they uh, uh, ensure a fight, a destroy any be okay. I feel no way out immediately, but we don't know what to say. The whole town will just go off. And a Paco and Tao Colo or Coito Bangme, or in a can be lay a ma petal me, Nimunca Jena, Mun, Impetor, Nan Jonacano, 
He says that oh, that that's in God translates as um, they just hang around um, wherever that they can find. Uh, he says his wife and uh, child hang around somewhere. He also hangs around somewhere until day breaks and then they continue their journey uh, in search of a new place they can call home. Past couple of minutes that we arrived here, um, the project manager, Mr. Godfrey Kwaku, together with a few of his officers have arrived in. Um, as you can see, the excavators are uh, working uh, now. You see, normally, sea waves are extremely high uh, in uh, August and September. And then with the global warming, the waves are even higher. We could see in other European countries how the sea is causing havoc. So that has increased the wave height and the erosion of the area which we have been contracted to operate. So what we are doing now is we have to minimize, eliminate or uh, minimize the effect of the erosion. So if you, if you could see, I've arranged some boulders, big boulders, parallel to the beach. That is to minimize the erosion while we are doing the construction. Maybe after Friday, we should be able to cover them up. Yeah. I was just asking a, a direct question that the expectation is that by the end of this week, you, you mentioned Friday, yes. by the end of this week, this place will be protected. Yes, it will be. I cannot say fully protected, but minimize it. Because if you say fully protected, then it means that nothing can happen. But I'm trying to minimize the effect on the waves. I can't give assurance that fully when I do this, it's even possible that the waves can be even higher than what I'm doing. Well, the MC for Ablikuma West, George Cyril Bray, joins us live with more on this. Uh, thank you very much, sir. We know that the residents there presented a petition to your office a couple of months back. Uh, how is it that we had to wait for the situation uh, to degenerate to this extent? Well, good evening and good evening to your viewers. Um, we have not sat aloof to let the situation degenerate into this uh, extent. Um, we have engaged the constituents or those living the inhabitants uh, extensively. Uh, what is it is that, um, unfortunately, uh, this is a project that the assembly cannot do all by itself. So we had to escalate it to the ministry in charge, and that is the Works and Housing Ministry. Fortunately, um, about two months ago, the minister, that is Honorable Asenso Boache, and the MP for the area, Honorable Esle Ousu Ekufo, joined my good self to go and have a look at the extent of damage. The minister assured us he's going back to get his uh, act together and then come back. Fortunately, I called him some weeks back and he told me he's seeking financial clearance such that he can get the contract of the con uh, contractor extended for him to complete the whole stretch, that is the stretch left from the, how do you call it, the, uh, the glyphic end is completed. So we, we say a quitter man to the Chemu Lagoon end okay. that is where we are getting a lot of uh, distraction now okay. so as we speak the minister has assured us he's getting financial clearance to get the problem resolved okay but but the residents say that you in particular facilitated uh, their request to alter the initial design of the sea uh, defense project to make way for a landing site for fishermen that seemed to be seem to have caused the problem is there a consideration to revert to the original design Okay, so it is not about the redesign that is a problem as we speak. It is about the extension of the contract. Because as we speak, the contractor virtually has almost ended what he's supposed to be doing. Where the landing beaches, you know, this is an area where we have a lot of uh, fishermen. It's a fishing community. So when the contractor was in the middle of the project, the Fisher folks or the fishermen came to see me that, okay. look, if we are going to have the wall running through to the Chemo end of the stretch, 
then it means they can't go fishing. And this is the source of livelihood for people in that area. So I engaged the contractor. And then the contractor said, okay, then when the contract is extended, what we can do is we create a groin, which invariably would still stop the tidal waves from coming way up to destroy the properties up there. Okay. And then equally, we can have somehow a, a, a creation of a landing area for their canoes as well. So in the long run, we were looking at killing a, 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 a two beds with a stone. Okay. Said that the fishermen would have their landing uh, site and equally we would have the distraction uh, kept. So it is not like mm. uh, the creation of the wall and the groin is what has stalled the project. Very but well. It is when my colleague... it is virtually ended and it has to be extended. Mm. When my colleague Manuel Cranton uh, went back to the area and we saw in the report, he spoke to the contractor on site. He said uh, latest by Friday something is going to be up. He fell short of giving us the details of what is being done in the immediate term. Can you help us on that? So what he is trying to do now is to put a few boulders along the shore such that it will, it will stem the tide when it's getting up mm. so the distraction would ease a bit. Okay. So it's not the main project that he's doing, but he's putting in, uh, if I can put it this way, he's putting in a mitigating uh, a strategy such that in the long run, uh, the distraction will be stemmed a bit whilst we wait on the minister to come in with an intervention that is going to help us construct the rest of the sea defense. And what can you tell us about that major project to deal with this holistically in the long term? Uh, what, what have you been hearing from the uh, Works and Housing Minister? The permanent well, solution. Well, I said earlier, uh, he's assured us that he's getting financial clearance said that we would be able to continue uh, with the project. Okay. But then let me, let me be quick in saying that I, I, I uh, for want of a right word, I'll say I empathize with the inhabitants of the area. Mm -hmm. When you go there yourself, you would know that indeed, or you'd appreciate that indeed, uh, uh, the distraction is, is, is quite... Uh, I don't, I don't even know the right way well, to Obviously, this then, is very uh, devastating, Mr. Bray, but uh, <laughs> are you considering evacuating the people uh, beyond the temporary works that you're doing, evacuating them, a permanent evacuation, uh, so that you can at least deal with the uh, human effect of these uh, uh, erosions, this, this devastation, and then have the space to deal with this permanently? For, for permanent evacuation, uh, the people living there are not for it. So we were thinking about temporary evacuation, which has been a challenge for the MP and myself now, because as we speak, our best bet would have been to put them at least even in classrooms where the people who were on, if they were on holidays, we could have easily done that. But unfortunately, uh, the people are in school and uh, it's become a bit of a challenge. So between myself and the MP, we are looking for uh, then at least if we get a, a two, three, four bedroom apartment where we can ask a few of them to share gradually such that uh, it will be a temporary mitigating factor. And then when the project is done, they can go back to their normal abode. Okay. But for now, uh, it's, it's a bit challenging and we are looking out for something like that to at least help them in the interim. Mr. Bray, thank you very much for joining us. That's the MC for Blakema West joining us on the uh, sea erosion uh, at Glyphe, uh, which has impacted the people there negatively. Away from that, four persons have been confirmed dead in Monday night's flooding of parts of the Ashanti region. According to the National Disaster Organization, four bodies, including two nine-year-olds, have been retrieved. But two others who went missing at Ahinima Kokobeng are yet to be found. And now Jima has more in the following report. At Kromwasi, a nine-year-old boy who went missing in the rain with two others got drowned on Monday. At Daban, another girl of the same age also died. 
The third incident was also recorded at Sokoban. Administrator at Nadmu, Nana Atakra Kodia, confirms the deaths. This is the account that we've received from uh, the assembly members and our officers who have confirmed the incident to us. Yes, we will continue to search. We will continue to search. And currently, as I'm speaking to you, search team is underway. The search team for each particular location of incident is underway. Close to three hours of torrential rains left part of the Kumase Obwasi Road flooded for hours. Two people who are still missing were part of a group of three who joined a car truck but jumped off as the flats pulled the vehicle to the wrong side of the road. Some eyewitnesses confirmed the incident. We saw the truck being drawn into the drain. The people jumped off and disappeared. The flood left many people stranded for more than three hours. Residents are blaming poor construction of drainage and building in waterways for the flood. It is the second time the area has flooded this year. All because you say, in Sunni Kwaya was a femuno, or the Senia Shedat Tonsasa. The waterway is now being filled up for construction, so the path has narrowed. In Tinsunu Kwaya was a femuno, I a kituebi. I didn't even say, I gave you a two one among your cock. Nay, you could move, I gave you a free. We have been to the assembly for help, but they haven't acted, even though they have visited the police. Other areas of the city witnessed similar incidents. At Inshaeso near Ahonjo, neighbors managed to rescue a man in his late 40s from drowning. His pickup truck was drawn into the stream after losing balance in the flood. Part of a recently constructed bridge has caved in to increasing flood. For Joy News, Nanaya Ojima Kumasi. Let's stay in the Ashanti region. Let me take you now to Amfinso, which is gaining notoriety as an enclave of internet fosters, popularly known as Sakawa Boys. There's already public outcry over the suspicious wealth of some youth in the town who opulently display flashy cars on the street. The heightened fear among residents comes in the wake of the recent disappearance of some children in the town. The chief of Ofenso has tagged security heads in the town to find ways of dealing with the growing concerns. Erastus Asaridonko has more. Residents of Ofenso say this viral video showing some young men showing off in a flashy convoy of unregistered modern cars boils their blood. In the video, the occupants, described as Sakawa, ritual internet frosters or scammers, are heard claiming one cannot be like them if they are unable to drink blood. So this is where you see in the viral video. Behind me is Antoine, and just in front of me is Domi. Where I'm standing is called Amodem. And this is where you see in the video with the young men parading the luxurious vehicles across the street right up there. Now, this is what has become the talk of town with people describing it as an act of scamming involving men supposed to be engaged in rituals for money. Some residents narrated personal accounts depicting young men seen carrying coffins half naked in the town's cemetery in the dead of the night. One of the two children who went missing in the town in the past six months has been found murdered. 
residents link the new craze for unexplained wealth to unexplained murders and disappearances in the town. Police will not immediately comment, but our sources say police patrols have been intensified. Two meetings between Nananum, members of the Municipal Security Council, and opinion leaders have been held in the past days to find solution to the menace. Nana Yao Kobia Amenfi, a senior linguist to the Paramount Chief of Offenso. We called all the security heads in the municipality to a meeting at the palace where we discussed this particular issue and they promised to take action. Last week, we also summoned them to the second meeting where of assemblyman, the MCE, everybody, we invited all of them to a meeting of Nananum. But uh, we are ha having some challenges. We have decided that we are organizing an emergency me meeting on the 4th, then for the traditional council to take final decision because we've met the security heads, we've met the uh, MCE, the assembly, all the assembly members, and all the security heads in the municipality. But still, no action is taken. Therefore, we want the Tarisha Council to take a final resolution on the issue. The story of Ofenso is a mixture of fear incited by unexplained wealth attained overnight by young people and the disappearance of children, especially the recent murder of a four-year-old girl. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaridonko of Finso Ashanti region. Now, the report of the three-member committee set up to look into the Ejira disturbances has exonerated the work of Love FM journalist Erastus Asaridonko. A careful look at the report shows that the committee substantially relied on this evidence and Joy News' video submitted to them. This flies in the face of a deliberate narrative by some members of the governing party, including the Asin Central MP, Kennedy Japan to blame his reportage and John News's live coverage of the disturbances for the deaths and injuries. So what exactly does the report say? Uh, let's bring you details of that report. So it says that uh, when you look at point five of the report, it says before dealing with these exhibits given to the committee by Abewakas, the committee observed that the said Abewakas was economical with the truth during his testimony before the committee. This, we note, affected his credibility. Despite the fact that Abu Akaz, during the demonstration on the 29th of June 2021, played a leading role in the said agitations and even granted lengthy interviews to both Edward Opomaf of City News and Erastus Asaridonko of the multimedia group, he cleverly and disingenuously presented the facts to the committee as if he did not take part in the presentation. Now, here's the point. However... When confronted with the videos tendered by Erastus, in which he was seen defiantly demanding justice and urging the youth on, he started weeping. So this is the first uh, of the major findings of the committee on Erastus's work. 14 says, evidence before us that, that is, Exhibits B series and F series tendered by both Erastus Sasaridonko and Edward upon mouth of City News, and these exhibits are the videos, uh, clearly shows that the burial of the deceased Kaka was without any violence until the arrival of the police route vehicle at the cemetery. It is therefore our finding from the evidence before us 
that the presence of the riot vehicle at the cemetery on the 29th of June was an act of provocation which incensed an already angry and violent youth, thereby culminating in the attack on the police riot vehicle. Another major finding of the committee, point 25, it says the testimony of the commander of the section, uh, 10 men that went to the Ejra, that went to Ejra on the 29th of June, uh, believe the testimony of the GOC, that's the Central Command, an examination of some of the video evidence tendered by Erastus Asari Donko show clearly that some of the youth were throwing stones and other implements towards the direction of the military men. The committee, however, do not consider these acts of the youth as extreme provocation that required the firing of live ammunition into the crowd. And you recall that some of the uh, military officers uh, who testified before, before the committee said that they were provoked, which then triggered their reaction. And so these are some of the uh, major findings of the committee on Erastus's work. But then let's look a bit at some of the recommendations of the committee uh, as far as this report is concerned. So it says that the committee recommends adequate compensation for the families of the two deceased persons, namely Abdul Nasir Yusuf and Mutala uh, Suraj Mohammed. Adequate compensation also be paid to other injured persons, uh, namely Louis Aipa, 20 years, Awal Mizbu, 16, and Nasif Nuhu, 30 years. These are the names known to the committee. And we'll hear the reaction of the family to this recommendation. It also recommends that the immediate transfer of the district police commander of Ejira, DSP Philip Kojohamon, first for his incompetence, in handling the situation for the fact that his relationship with the committee seems to have, uh, with the community, seems to have been damaged beyond repair. They also recommend that the structural expansion uh, of the Adra police station and an increase in personnel of the unit. And then we'll take a few. This one says, we recommend the removal of the Adra uh, Sechadumase Municipal Chief Executive Honorable Mohammed. Uh, Sally Subamba, since the continuous presence of the MCE would exacerbate the already tense security situation in Idra. And we know that he withdrew his application uh, to be nominated uh, for the position. It is further recommended that the military establishment review the actions of the section on the ground, led by Lieutenant Martin Opoku Edusei, for the inappropri inappropriate use of force and apply appropriate sanctions. So these are some of the uh, recommendations of the uh, committee. Uh, meanwhile, the family of Kaka has described the report as nebulous and politically engineered. Uh, Nafui Mohammed, who speaks for them, starts by reacting to the finding that a family feud may have led to the death of Kaka. Family were shocked when we heard that because we have seen his good work in Ezra through the social activism, and of which a section of tape reported, recorded videos and audios were submitted to the committee for their perusal. So we have the view that the committee have heard they have not gone or they have not done their work according to the framework set, because their main emphasis is to envisage what really happened on the 29th of June, but they said our case regarding Kaka's investigation is a criminal case. Well, he's also described the recommendation for the payment of compensation to families and victims as inadequate. He wants government to provide a lifetime cover for the injured. You're welcome to business. I'm Charles Aite, Executive Director of the Center for Finance, Economics and Inequality Studies. Benjamin Amoa has said that the resolve by the Bank of Ghana to phase out the one and two city notes currently in circulation with coins could affect cost of living in the long run. Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ines Addison, told journalists uh, that the central bank had realized that it was not cost effective to keep the two sets of notes in circulation as they mostly returned dirty and worn out, requiring frequent replacement. According to Dr. Amoa, the move will trigger a rounding up of the cost of goods in the country. But first, let's listen to the governor of the Bank of Ghana. 
You would recall that this was a note that was issued as a commemorative note. You know, so commemorative notes are not notes that you continue to print, right? And therefore, what we have done uh, in the last two years is in to introduce the two CD Ghana coin, right? And the two CD Ghana coins, I believe, are, are, are circulating, and you would expect that eventually they would more or less play the role that the two CD notes are playing. Both the one Ghana CD note and the two Ghana CD note would eventually be phased out because they are not cost effective in terms of the uh, printing costs of notes that circulate very widely and they come back very torn and soiled and very difficult for our currency processing machines to process them. We have, we have, we have bills and bills of one CD notes which we are not even able to process. So the view in the longer term is to uh, more or less you know, get out of the notes of one CD and two CD and then use the one, one Ghana CD coin and the two Ghana CD coin. However, analyst Dr. Benjamin Amwa fears traders may inflate their prices to correspond with the move by the central bank. He spoke earlier on the marketplace. It is a case that uh, the currency, especially the one CD and two CDs, has to be taken out of circulation because, for now, they are not cost effective in transaction. Many people on the street will not prefer to use it to, to buy. The bundle of goods and services that we consume now is more than the one Ghana and two Ghana CDs. So it is not a preferred currency on the market now. So yes, it is a good call that the central bank will consider to gradually withdraw it from the system. Well, but you know, those in the informal sector, the market woman, you know, the food vendors could argue with your point because most of these services are within this bracket of transaction. It is not the case that it is being withdrawn, coins of one Ghana CDs and coins of two Ghana CDs will be minted to replace the fiat, the paper note. And so the woman at the market, the man at the market will still be able to transact in services or products that would need this level of currency. But if you look at the bulk, the bulk of currency that we use, we are no longer running our businesses on one Ghana cities and two Ghana cities. Cost of living has gone up. And once cost of living has gone up, the currency that we prefer in terms of the value of currency, the denomination that we prefer, will move beyond the one Ghana and two Ghana cities. Well, the profit before tax of the banking industry shot up by 27.4% to 4.9 billion cities in the first eight months of this year, signaling a recovery in economic activity. According to the Bank of Ghana, this is higher than the growth of 19.2% registered a year ago. Charles Nixon Obwa takes a look at the development in the banking industry and has more in this report. The Bank of Ghana described the banking sector as strong and world capitalized with stronger growth in total asset, investment, and deposits. This is represented in the financial statement of majority of the banks. It further said the financial soundness indicators had remained strong whilst the industry's capital adequacy ratio of 20.7% at the end of August this year was way above the regulatory minimum threshold of 11.5%. Net interest income, mainly interest from loans and investment, grew by 17.9% to 8.3 billion cities at the end of August. This is marginally lower than the 18.7% growth recorded a year ago. Net fees and commissions, on the other hand, grew strongly by 21.8% to 1.85 billion cities, higher than the growth of 8.9% for the same period last year. This reflected a continued recovery in trade finance related and other ancillary businesses of the banks. Also, loan loss provisions for the period was far lower than last year. Meanwhile, private sector credit growth has not fully recovered to pre-COVID-19 pandemic levels due to lingering supply-side risk aversion from the shock of the coronavirus pandemic.
And that'll be it for business. We have sports coming next. Just stay. Many thanks for staying with us. I am Hans Mensa and the chairman of the Black Stars Management Committee, Fred Papu, believes Milo Van Rijvac has what it takes to meet the target in his contract as he begins his second Black Stars tenure. The Serbian has been tasked to win next year's AFCON and guide the Black Stars to the 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar. Fred Papu, who was GFA vice president during Ghana's World Cup debut in 2006, says he believes in Milo's ability to deliver. Let his words, and his words speak for him. He's a very focused and determined person who doesn't tolerate any laxity in this team. Okay, so, so future-wise, yeah. what does Milo represent? I believe uh, he represents a lot of hope. He's a very hardworking and committed person, very de determined and disciplined in every aspect of their work. And I'm sure he's one who will make sure he puts his all and his players put in their all for the success of their team. That's that starts giving to him. Is it a reality? What? Winning the AFCON and also qualifying for the FIFA World Cup. Is that a reality? Uh, it's a reality, but at the end of the day, I don't believe in uh, targets. Everything depends on God. We only have to put in effort. That's so still Milo Van Rijver because former under-20 World Cup winner and one of the few active players from his first stint as coach of the Black Stars, Samuel Inkum has commended the Ghana Football Association for reappointing the Serbian trainer and has also described him as a disciplinarian who will have absolute control over the dressing room. There is more in this Joy Sports report. The 67-year-old made a return to the job he abandoned in 2010, just days after Ghana exited the FIFA World Cup tournament at the quarterfinals, following an impressive showing at the Mundial. Milo carved a niche for himself after an impressive run with the Black Stars and former Under-20 World Cup winner, who is also one of the few active players since Milo's first stint with the Black Stars. Samuel Inkum has showered praises on the Serbian trainer, saying he's the right man for the job. Let's put it in this way that, you know our Black Stars team, yes? I'm not saying that the coaches uh, before were not good coaches, you understand? But the team that we have, we need, we need a disciplined coach. I will not say previous ones are no discipline. You understand what I mean? But we need, we need coaches that uh, they can control in the dressing room as well. And uh, I, I, that is why I'm saying that uh, I, I was really happy when I heard that the FA was talking to him because I don't the day he know what he, he know what he want. The former Black Stars defender also described the Serbian as one who will have total control over the dressing room due to how strict he is. Milovan, for me, I would just put that Milovan is, a, is such a lovely man. But when he comes about the work, it's different. He doesn't want anybody to make any decision, you understand? As for his work, he control, he's in charge, he's his own boss, you understand? Milovan is more disciplined as well. Training time, when he says six, you have to be there six. When you are there six one, you will never train. So that tells you how he understands his job. This tells you how he wants to win. And if you are talking about all this kind of thing, that will let you win a game. Especially if I'm late 20 minutes, other players late 40 minutes, five minutes. How can the team, team you will never have a teamwork. But he's a man that, when he tells you sleep, you have to. If you don't sleep and he finds out, you'll be under punishment. Since leaving the shores of the country, Milo has managed several top-notch posts in football, including taking over the head coach jobs at Algeria, Qatar and Thailand. However, his last active spell in the dugout came two years ago when he lasted just six months as Thailand head coach. He was sacked following a loss to India. And that's it for this installment. There is more sports later in the bulletin, including updates from the UEFA Champions League. And it's now time for the latest in the world of showbiz. My brother KMJ is here with the latest. Mm. Uh, good to see you, but uh, it's on it's a sad really note. We've lost a gem. Yeah, indeed we have. Uh, this morning, I think that uh, it was not something that we were looking out for. I mean, we know that our legends are aging, but we still want them to live longer. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we have to uh, say goodbye to one of the legends that has contributed a lot in the highlife industry, Nanam Pedu, who died uh, this morning at 5.30. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a count of it. I mean, he's had about 800 songs.
to his credit. And this is one man that was also considered as, uh, you know, the people that really did so much for Ghanaian high life Thank music. You. He's the, one of the most artists that has a lot of records in terms of albums. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the history of Ghana, so nobody, nobody gets close to that. Okay. So indeed, we've lost a legend and we're not, we're not uh, you know, it's not something that we wanted to Absolutely, uh, a wrong time. But he's been sick for 11 months. So you can imagine the situations and how he had to deal with all of those things. Mm -hmm. And now, unfortunately, mm -hmm. we have this situation. The, the son speaks about it and tells us exactly what happened to the father. Okay. My father, for the past, let's say, 11 months, has been ill. Unfortunately, uh, at dawn, around 3.30, I had a call from my residence that uh, my father's illness has worsened, so I and my brother should rush so that uh, we take him to the hospital. We did so at dawn. We tried as fast as possible, and we went to the Ligon UGMC hospital uh, through 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 to the Achimata hospital, which we couldn't find any assistance there. Okay, when you say you couldn't find assistance, and what do you mean? Yeah, when we went there. The, the doctor was asleep. We banged the door. He came and he was rather asking us, uh, why were we banging the door so much? After he said, he is coming. And we said, oh, please, we are not here for argument. We have a problem. Then he said, oh, no, we don't have to tell him that we have a problem. He already realized that we have a problem. So we found out that we couldn't have any help there. So we had to extend our journey to the Legon Hospital, that's the UGMC hospital. Um, the doctors tried as much as they could to revive him, but unfortunately, we lost our father, Nana Kwame Ampedu. So today, as we speak, at the time of 5.24 a.m., today, Tuesday, the 28th of September, 2021, Ajunto for hene nana kwame ampedu is no more. And uh, he had the yeah he was the founder of the African Brothers Band, mm -hmm. which also had uh, you know a few others that have passed on. He's done some great stuff. Yeah. But the question is, after his burial, um, what happens? How are we going to remember him? We lost now. Kosha recently. Yeah. So the question people keep asking, we're losing our legends. What are we doing to institutionalize their work, their craft, mm. uh, so that people, generations to come, would appreciate what they've done? Look at the quality of the music we are listening yeah. to today. Yeah. And it's, it's going to be like that. I mean, as at this moment, we're still fighting about royalties. So you can imagine what's going to happen in the coming years. And the others who are yet to also join him. I mean, obviously, we have a, a, breaking, a breaking down industry bit by bit almost every day. So mm. we, we can... He's so rest in peace. Yeah. What more do you have for us? And there also, um, you know, there were claims about the ambulance not getting there on time. Uh, the, the son speaks about that. And uh, there have been investigations ongoing. But uh, he tells us that if the ambulance had arrived earlier, I'm sure that uh, the situation would have been different. Okay. Yes. Ghanaians, most especially when, when, we, when we called the hospital or maybe somebody prominent like Nanam Pedu, you have seen that the ambulance is there. We've told you this person is in the ambulance and you are telling us that doctor is sleeping. No, these things must stop in Ghana. It, it should stop in Ghana. So I just need to understand and clarify quickly. So the ambulance did come, but it just came late. Late. It came late. And they, they were aware they are coming for such a great man. So every, they must do everything to come on time. If they had come on time, and if we have taken him on time, maybe they could have sustained him. Unfortunately, turn of event. Yeah, so that's what it is. May he so rest in perfect peace. Now we'll move on to comedy and comedian wise. One of the Ghana's very few comedians has been talking about his achievements and what it means to him and his colleagues. He believes that if his colleagues are able to also see what he has done and emulate, it's definitely going to be a motivation for them to also do better. And he's been talking to us. He spoke to me on uh, Showbiz Now uh, this morning. Okay. The fact that I can't look down on myself, that is one thing that I really uh, think I, 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 I have taken note of. Uh, when you quantify everything that I have done so far, mm. Uh, I, I think I've not 
to me, I've not done enough. But to the world, this is what I've presented to you. Mm. And if it would be a challenge for other comics to also start working hard to also, I mean, take risk to do other stuff instead of doing just stand-up, I think um, it would be a good challenge for the industry as well. Has it made a lot of money for you, by the way? Yeah, I'm using iPhone 13. It came last month. Which is about 7,000, uh, 8,000 and something, something. So it yes, means you can, you can boldly say that um, this job has given you money. You're rich because of comedy. I'm not rich, but I'm comfortable and I'm peaceful. You understand? If I say I'm rich, it means I'm having a luxurious house and I'm having a car. I don't have a car. How do you manage to finish <laughs> this interview without <laughs> laughing? You know, and that's comedian worries. But otherwise, I thought he was Nigerian. I didn't know he was. He's a Ghanaian. He, but he's been in Nigeria a couple of times. He's had uh, the likes of Basket Mouth, all okay. of them working with him as well. So Great stuff. It means that's, that's some uh, head. Thank you me. very much, KMG, for bringing us the latest in the world of show. Absolutely. And that's it. Uh, we have some more stories for you after this break. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us here on Joy News Prime. Our Greek Minister, Dr. Owusu Efriyakutu, says the country must take another look at subsidizing farm, farming inputs for farmers because of the cost involved. The government has spent nearly $1 billion to subsidize fertilizers and improve seeds for farmers under the Planting for Food and Jobs program. Speaking during her store of the OT and Volta regions, the minister argued that as an agricultural economist, he does not believe in subsidies but instituted uh, it was instituted because he wanted to show farmers that such inputs will increase their yield. You will see a very sharp increase in the number of uh, beneficiaries and then the quantities of fertilizers and seeds that have been distributed. And that's reflected in the production. He didn't give us the data on the production of the main crops, but if it's there, you will see the yields as he indicated. We had six tons per per metric ton uh, in Gakko uh, before then, before this program started. It was barely two, two tons per hectare. So it means that we've gone up three times. And this is, these are the kinds of things that we should be showcasing uh, to praise the farmers of Volta that in spite of all the negative propaganda which uh, uh, started at the beginning of planting for food and jobs, now they've come to the realization that it is beneficial to them. We don't produce fertilizer in Ghana. The places that produce fertilizer in Europe and in America have been badly hit by the COVID because of the close downs and so on. In England, Yara, which is one of the biggest fertilizer companies in the world, is shutting down factories. In Europe, the others are shutting down factories. So they are speculating that there will be shortage of fertilizer. And uh, of course, that means that Fertilizer prices are going up and up and up, which will mean that farmers will get less fertilizer applied on their fields. And they're even talking about shortage of food in Europe. So we, are, we as price takers are not immune to that. Dr. Friakot also slammed the NDC in the Volta region for its criticism of the Planting for Food and Jobs program in the region. The NDC branch in the region, in a statement, lamented the shortage of fertilizer, which they say has led to hikes in prices of fertilizer. But speaking at all, as part of his Volta region tour, the Agri Minister described the NDC as naysayers whose propaganda against the Planting for Food and Jobs program will be killed. I improve seed instead of taking part of your seed, your crop, your grain, and putting it somewhere and bringing it back every year to recycle that they've been doing their whole lives. If you get improved seed outside every year to plant and you apply the chemical fertilizer, you're going to get increased production. Very criminal elements who are smuggling across the border so that the farmer doesn't get the full benefits. It is totally wrong. No government can preside over that kind of arrangement. This is why we excluded some of these districts from trading. And then not only in Volta region here, all the way, there are 14 or 15 districts, 21. 21 districts that for two years we have banned distribution of fertilizer because they are smuggling the thing away. So if somebody sits there and says, oh, we are not getting the fertilizer along these uh, uh, districts and therefore uh, uh, 
uh, agriculture is, is declining in the region, then they don't know what they are talking about. The data is very clear. They should come here because we are the ones who generate the real, genuine information on these issues, not those people calling themselves pe a peasant farmers and so on who represent nobody. You know, the Agric Minister says the goal is to make Ghana a net exporter of improved seeds. The idea is that we are importing a lot of seeds from abroad. We want to be a net importer of seeds. So we are encouraging as many people as, as farmers, uh, investors, anybody to come into the seed industry. And the, the research institutes are too happy to collaborate with the private sector and providing the breeder seed, the foundation seed, for, for that work to go on. So, and fortunately for us, it is going on. I mean, we, have, we now have more hybrid seed coming from the University of Ghana, uh, from Sari and the others who have worked, that have done a lot of research on hybrids and are now coming out with a product in the field. And I'm sure that in the next two, three years, we should be able to start exporting our own brand of uh, seeds. Let's go to Zoom now and speak to Anthony Morrison, who is the CEO of the Chamber of Agribusiness. Mr. Morrison, thank you very much for joining us. Now, uh, as we have seen in other programs, subsidies have always not been sustainable. Isn't it time to face the reality and prepare farmers in that regard? Thank you very much, and a very good evening um, to your viewers. Um, yes, I think um, the Chamber of Agribusiness and many other stakeholders have for some time now been calling for uh, some innovative measures within the subsidy industry. Uh, let me say that um, there are positives and or advantages and disadvantages uh, running uh, subsidies, in, especially within the agriculture sector. Uh, for instance, you may want to look at how costly it will be to the taxpayer, uh, then how the harm it will cause to the economy, because um, it doesn't bring innovation to the farmers farmers are unable to diversify their land use for other economic ventures and also uh, some actions uh, that could be taken on a more competitive and comparative advantages that the economy will behold. Uh, but on that same score, uh, there is an enabling environment uh, which is required for subsidies to thrive. As we speak, uh, I'm sorry, the minister is calling for some subsidies remover does it also imply that the farmers are able to buy uh, fertilizers and seeds at the current high cost? Uh, we are seeing currently on the international market, he himself has stated adequately that uh, Yara International has closed down some of their shops uh, with monitored issues in London where food prices are going up as a result of fertilizer prices. We've monitored uh, uh, Russia. Urea have gone up uh, tremendously, mm -hmm. and some other parts of China where we uh, we have been notified that the Chinese government have asked uh, factories in China to reduce production. So when you reduce production at the major factories, that implies that the cost of uh, this uh, product will go up on the international market. Mr. So Morrison, do I hear you say that indeed the idea of subsidizing uh, fertilizers or farm inputs generally is something you agree with, except that this is not the right time uh, to go ahead with such a policy? Well, we do not entirely agree with um, subsidies. Subsidies do not uh, uh, develop an economy. Uh, subsidies have to be very innovative. But let's look at why subsidies are even introduced at all. Okay, subsidies uh, play a large role in enabling higher supply at lower prices with this specific time. And this is the critical time because consumers uh, the, the, the economic hardships and they are buying food. Uh, as we speak now, uh, 50 kg of maize, which used to sell at 68 Ghana cities, is now being sold at 150 Ghana cities. And the consumers are, are all at, uh, can all attest to it. We have seen how the, the, the ball of Kenke and uh, Banku and all keep shrinking and the prices going up. We used to sell at two cities, now in three cities and across uh, uh, other marketplaces, even your cocoa alcohol that you buy. Now, so do we say that farmers are able to buy now uh, of a bag of uh, fertilizer that used to sell at 
120 Ghana cities and now being sold at 280. Okay, so if farmers are rich and able to do so, so be it. But we think that at this critical time, when we're talking about food crisis, food shortages across the country, uh, we're talking about how farmers were not able to access fertilizer and therefore have reduced their farm acreage. So um, what we are expecting in terms of the total uh, production output across the grains and cereals, across the horticulture, are critical for the sustainability of this economy. So we can't, at this point, be talking about re uh, complete removal. You have to be looking at a strategic system where you implement some um, redrawal thinking, okay. okay? So you, you introduce some structures that will make and, and, uh, the farmers ought to be well um, informed that in the next two to three years, this is the, the government strategy, that the next season, we aren't going to give you subsidies at 100% or 50% as we speak. Okay. It is now. We'll give it to you at 30%. So it's a gradual removal process. You can't go for a complete redrawal. Very not well. at this time, well. when okay. we are not able to actually get uh, what we needed in terms of even to feed. We are now importing maize mm. into the country, okay, for our poultry uh, farmers, okay. for our pigry farmers, aquaculture farmers. So a lot of things ought to be done. And Very well. Mr. Morrison, for, we hear you. Uh, and uh, essentially, you're saying that government should uh, draw a program to sensitize the farmers in order so that uh, this can be rolled out in a manner that will not affect, uh, you know, our food security. Certainly. Thank you very much. That's uh, Anthony Morrison, CEO of the Chamber of Agribusiness, joining us on the uh, suggestion by the Agri Minister that government uh, will discontinue the sub subsidies uh, given for fertilizers and other farm inputs. Now, away from that, the minority MPs on Parliament's Select Committee on Health clash with the military personnel at the yet to be completed Afari Military Hospital in the Ashanti region Monday. The men at one of the facilities refused to grant the MPs access to the abandoned facility without express permission from their superiors. I know you are seeking distractions from your people, and I'm giving you this harmless advice. The rules are not to your profession, but in your own interest, in order not to escalate anything, let's handle it the way you want us to handle it. Let's finish what we are doing here. We will all go to engage whatever, whoever we want to engage. I am telling you that if you go, if you do anything more than more than this, your leaders. Whom you are spoken to will blame you at the end of the day. So, uh, so please, you know, with the greatest that's respect, that's respect that's that's they will blame you, they will, they will sacrifice you at the end of the day. You have identified me. Okay. for me, you have not identified me. Please. If we should go to him, no problem. Let's finish what we are doing here. We can all go. Okay, I can know. We are granting an interview here. Once we finish, we are all going to So when we finish, we go. Mr. Akando. Yes. With all due respect, I, that's have, I gave I've, you the I've, maximum respect. Listen, you see, that's I beg listen, you in the listen, name of God. Let I, the site I don't have a problem. We're going Canada. to the site engineer, it's not a problem. I'm saying that we can't go to a site engineer and come back here again. We can't go to the site engineer. In my shoe. I don't have a problem. I have I'm not saying. disagreed with you. you listen it. to me carefully. Mm -hmm. Whatever I'm saying, I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I have not disagreed with you. It's, the, it's nothing harmful going to the site engineer. I'm saying we will go. But you know the distance from that gate to this place. You can be here. Can go can. Let's, let's finish. We all go to the site engineer. I mean, it's a, it's a very I've simple. Under, I've understood you. Good. So but what I'm saying is, uh, is good. Uh, you see, one, you also have to seek clearance. 
No problem. I'm saying that. I'm saying that. Whatever explanation. What I'm saying. We have something. Can I come in? So they're all together. Let me tell you something. We are more. Please. I didn't want to know that. I wanted to know. Let me just. Let me give. Let me give you something before you come in. Let me talk to you. This afternoon there was an information that. Now the minority in parliament says it will push for a parliamentary probe into the various abandoned health facilities across the country. Ranking member on the health committee, Kovna Minta Kando, who is incensed over the development, argues that loans worth millions of dollars procured to construct the facilities are not being put to their intended use. My colleague, Chrissy Parker Wilson, brings us to the current state of the Abetifi Health Facility. The Abetifi referral hospital in the eastern region and we understand that this building was put up under the Mahama administration in 2014 and was expected to complete somewhere in 2016 but as you can see this is the state of the project the minority caucus on the health committee again with their unannounced visits have come to this facility to inspect whether indeed there is some progress going on with this facility. I understand that these metals, as you see, are being used to support the blocks because they are falling off. So this is the current situation here at the Abitifi Referral Hospital. The minority uh, caucus of the health committee is quite incensed about the development. Um, yesterday, we visited the Komeu Hospital. We went to the Fomena Hospital and went to the Afari uh, Military Hospital in the Ashanti region. Today we are here at the Abetifi Refire Hospital, and then the situation is almost the same. The minority says government should quickly ensure that all the abandoned health facilities are completed. Member of Parliament for Yilo Kobo constituency Albert Tete Nyakote is demanding the immediate operationalization of the newly constructed Yilo Kobo District Hospital. The 120 bed health facility, which was completed in January this year and handed over to the government, is yet to be put to its intended use. John News checks are the facility reveal installation of medical equipment, a fully furnished administration block, and a standby ambulance. This is the Yellow Cobo uh, Hospital. We are told that this facility was completed and handed over to uh, government January this year or early this year. Well, the assurances was that uh, the facility will see some operationalization by August this year. The Ministry has applied for financial clearance for recruitment of support staff. And when this is approved, the Sumania this hospital will be allocated with the requisite support staff to enable operations to commence. Meanwhile, clinical staff have been identified and will soon be posted to the facility. We are anticipating that the hospital will be commissioned before the end of August 2021. Well, that hasn't happened. The member of parliament for the area is unhappy with the situation. He fears this project would also add up to the number of abandoned projects across the country. He's asking government and the health minister to quickly ensure that this project is put to use. So I had the opportunity to file a question to ask the minister to come and open the hospital. And he said the hospital was going to be open soon. I think that was in June. Up to today, the place is lying idle. Our people don't have access to healthcare because the hospital is very small. It's a, it's a health center. And a lot of people are coming from all villages and they cannot get access to the place. It's, so I'm taking the opportunity to call on the government that this hospital must be open soon must be open now for our people to get health care. If you keep it like this, then we are actually causing financial loss to the state. Because all the money is here, all the investment is here, and our people do not have access to health care. Ranking member on the health committee uh, who toured the project to see that indeed is a completed facility, which Richard is called uh, to government and also indicated that the minority will ensure that government really complete all the projects that have been abandoned. My understanding was that um, it should have been in operation by now. So uh, when I was coming, I thought I was going to see medical doctors and nurses uh, in this facility. Unfortunately, um, it's been handed over technically to the ministry and they're still adding. We are not very careful. You see the, the, the grasses have started growing weedy. 
and very soon the facilities will also start deteriorating so i think that i will add to the appeal from the from 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 the mp that government must immediately um, operationalize this facility for the people in the area to get a full benefit of the facility for joining us i'm reporting from the Yunokobo special hospital Police have arrested the owner of Nature's Hand Therapeutic Center at Bawehi and Accra for sexually abusing women who visit his facility to seek help. Jonathan Ohenin Kunim, who claims to be a neuromuscular specialist and a physiotherapist, told desperate women with various health conditions that they needed to be sexually aroused before they could be treated. The police arrested him following the latest expose by the fourth estate Manasseh Azure Awene in an investigative documentary titled The Licensed Sex Predator. Here are excerpts. When I do it continuously, I, I get sexually unstable. He starts by massaging and inserts his entire hand in my vagina. And sometimes I felt his hand in my womb. I think I'm not the first victim, according to the rumor I heard. I believe that is something probably he does to innocent women or wives, people who come seeking medical attention. And it's random. It's not like every woman I see. He came inside and then he had to me. Then things were more intense. He was touching me, kissing my butt, wanting my butt, and trying to find his way inside my vagina. I noticed that he was actually massaging my buttocks and inserting his fingers into my vagina. The next I knew, it was his penis. Um, it comes to me as a surprise. I am not aware of any, you know, condition. And in this case, it's a lumbar spondylosis. Um, I am not aware of any such condition that would require the patient to be sexually aroused before treatment can be administered. No, it's, it is a surprise. Things go on. So I'm really, really surprised. You're saying it's not true? No. If it's not true, I should be in jail by now. In 2018, Ifwa, a 30-year-old banker, not her real identity, was introduced to a specialist when she and her husband needed a child. The couple had suffered a traumatic loss and hoped this specialist would help restore their joy. We have here Dr. Jonathan Ohenin Nkumi of the Nature's Hand Therapeutic Center at Bangu. Doc, welcome to the show. Initially, I was kind of reluctant since I didn't really know how he used to operate. I decided to give it a try. I was there at the clinic and actually he doesn't do the normal diagnosis that you'll be asked to do a lab and those things. He actually has a way. He checks. I don't know whether your pulse or something behind your palm, which looks strange, but that's how he's able to tell if you have a condition or not. He said he learned it in China. There's the back of the hand and it has like 360 points. Okay. There, so if I want to check there, so I want to check how how you sleep, so I check the pulse and the nerve points. And... Uh, okay, so what are you checking now? I'm checking your sleep ratio, actually. My and sleep your, ratio? Yes. Okay, and? Four hours, 35 minutes, give or take 10 minutes. Yesterday? Yes, last night to this morning. This guy's a puppet. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I didn't because I didn't sleep early. I, oh, okay. I, I, yeah, I stayed up late because I was working on a, a script. So, and today your eating has been a bit off. You've, take, you've taken a lot of water, which is good, but your yes. eating is yes, I've taken a lot of water today. Yes. and I've, I, I just, I've just eaten once something okay. very little. Okay. Okay. But all in all, you have a very good pulse. Your heart is very, very good. My heart is good. Very. Very circulation. Is good. Is a liar. <laughs> I won't say hundred percent. But some were kind of accurate, so. And he mentioned that I had a problem with my cervix and that kind of thing. So I needed to do a procedure which would help me to conceive once therapy had been done. I asked what the therapy was about, and he said he had to insert like a probe into my reproductive vagina, let me put it that way. Sort of manipulate certain things there before I would be able to conceive. If I was not comfortable with the procedure, but it is said that a woman in labor 
does not hide her private pass from the birth attendant. She was in dire need of a child and had to give in to the requirements of the treatment despite her misgivings about the specialist and the discomfort involved in the procedure. According to him, before the procedure has to be done, you need to, if you are with your partner, your partner has to get you aroused so that your cervix can open. It also sounded strange to me, but I was like, okay, I also want a baby. And if this is what the doctor is saying, of course I need to give it a try. The facility was not conducive for Ifwa to be aroused by her husband. But as I later found out, that prescription was a bait. A trap which Jonathan Ohenin Kunim employed in order to violate women who visited his facility. Once the woman could not be aroused, he would then take over that responsibility. He inserted something like a probe, I don't know what it was, into me and he kept doing his own thing there. So at a point, he would ask my partner that he probably should go and buy ice block or something. And I realized that it's more like, though he didn't penetrate, it was more like he was trying to have sex with me, trying to play with me. He was trying to play with me down there getting me aroused and I wasn't feeling comfortable. So that's an excerpt of the documentary, The Licensed Sex Predator. And on the Super Morning Show uh, today, we had people calling to share the experience about, you know, similar things they've been through. Uh, we can hear some of them. So we were married for almost about two decades and as, as usual, there's definitely going to be ups and downs in marriages. My spouse decided to seek whatever, is it help, intervention or whatever from some of these people. I don't know if it's the same gentleman you're talking about. Along the line, we had this U.S. visa lottery that was supposed to go to the U.S. just to realize that my second child was mine. A confirmation, a confession from the woman hmm. brought it up that those times that we're having that issue, she was directed to go see one of these people. I don't know if they are counselors or whatever. Hmm. And through those sessions, they started having something to do. And she found herself pregnant. The marriage is broken as we speak because of that. I don't know the first name of whoever the man is. I don't want to know the second. But who that person is, if it's hearing me, has broken a marriage over two decades and he should be ready for it. Karma really comes after him. You're watching Johnny's Prime with me, and this minute we're taking a break. On Worry 10, we'll bring you more business and sports. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us here on Joining Spiderman in business. The operations of the rural and community banks in Ghana are seriously being affected because of their locked up funds at the National Trust Holdings Company Limited. In total, more than 100 million CDs worth of investment from the said banks are locked up. All 145 of them held their funds with the NTHC until the central bank cleanup, which resulted in 53 fund management uh, companies being, having their license revoked. Prince Pia has more in the following report. All the 145 RCBs held their funds with NTHC until the central bank cleanup, which resulted in 53 finance houses and fund management companies licenses were revoked. Interestingly, the license of NTHC was not revoked, which sent signals that it was operating on a stronger footing. But after months, the RCBs and other investors at NTHC are unable to access their funds. Sources at NTHC have said that the government owes them in that those funds have been used for government contract. Therefore, until government pays them, there's little they can do. But government since December 2020 have carved out 8.5 billion Ghana cities to help pay investors of the defunct asset management companies. 3.1 billion Ghana cities during the mid-year budget in December last year and 5.5 billion after the 2021 budget statement in Parliament. In addition, government in August this year released a total of 800 million Ghana cities to be paid to road contractors as debt owed them. The question, however, is why was the NTAC license not revoked 
or liquidated to receive some of the bailout given the asset management companies. Again, if government is owing NTAC as claimed by its officials, then why is government not paying them as such? Why should the innocent investors suffer from these developments? The implications, however, are that the situation has already affected the capital adequacy ratio and profitability levels of the RCBs. According to them, when the lockdown funds are paid, they will be able to give more loans to support farmers as well as small businesses in the operational areas to help them expand, a situation which the universal banks are usually unable to support. Again, the RCBs have therefore cancelled most of their corporate social responsibilities they embark on in these operational areas. The rural banks have further argued that the Security and Exchange Commission acted within its mandate of protecting investors and authorized a partial bailout of up to 50,000 Ghana cities to all customers of the affected fund management companies, but ignored to act on the situation with NTAC that is equally and directly guilty of same non-performance. Several attempts by these affected rural banks to retrieve their locked up funds from NTAC have yielded no result, and this unfortunate situation has negatively affected the operation in many ways. In the wake of this development, the rural banks claim they are unable to wait any longer, regardless of the further promises still being made by NTAC. Government of Ghana being the major shareholder of NTAC through its state agencies like SNIT, is now being called to do the needful to ensure it settles monies owed to NTAC, which NTAC claims is causing them not to be able to settle debt owed them to these poor and suffering rural and community banks. Prince Apia reporting. Wilma Africa Limited, producers of Phyto Oil, has donated 100,000 Ghana CDs to the National Cardiothoracic Center. Head of Marketing for the group Patients in Prayer says the donation is to support heart surgeries for underprivileged children at the Cardiothoracic Center at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. There's more in this report. Research shows that cardiovascular diseases are one of the causes of death across the globe. Also, six babies every day are born with a heart disease. Wilma Africa Limited launched the Frito Healthy Hearts campaign last year to support the National Cardiothoracic Center to help patients, especially underprivileged children, to be properly catered for. Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death across the world. And especially during this COVID era, people with um, cardio diseases are really at a higher risk. So it becomes very important that we educate people on living healthy lifestyles to prevent them from even getting this disease, or even those who have it also to help manage this disease. Yeah. We actually support children because they are the future of the nation. And aside that, children are part of the family. If children are not well, parents are also not well. You realize that a mother is unable to go to work or a father is unable to attend to his duties because his child is not well. So as we support these children, we are actually supporting the family and therefore the whole nation. A surgeon with the National Cardiothoracic Center, Dr. Eko Mensa, made a call to institutions to support the center. According to him, many of the heart diseases can be treated provided there are enough funds. We are seeing increasing numbers of heart-related diseases year after year. And uh, we realize that a lot of them can actually be prevented. Frito joined us last year. Um, they have joined in the vision to promote the health of the heart um, globally, especially um, here in Ghana. And so last year, they donated an amount of 100,000 Ghana, 100, Ghana cities, which went to support surgeries for six children. For such a corporate entity that is um, helping save lives like that, um, we want to entreat the general Ghanaian populace to also support them. And uh, as we are supporting them, we call on other brands and other companies also to emulate their example. Media personality Na Ashoko commended Wilma for the donation and further called on private entities to support initiatives like these so that the public is not over dependent on the government. I think
think it's very amazing what Wilma Africa is doing. Um, last year we were here, they donated 100,000 Ghana cities in support of some children who needed heart surgeries. I was very privileged to meet some of the children and sometimes when you hear these things, it sounds like a story until you actually meet the beneficiaries and see the change that Wilma has brought into their life. Our health system needs support. We cannot rely on the government all the time to come to our aid. While we rely on the government, private sector should also take initiative, especially when it comes to health of children. They are the future. The Ghana Export Promotion Authority, GEPA, has presented farm inputs to about 20 trainee entrepreneurs selected across the eastern, central and Volta regions. Deputy Trade Minister Herbert Scrapper, who presented the inputs, called on the trainees to develop themselves from the global market. You want to chop money, you have to sweat. <laughs> so this goes to our young guys out there. There is a job in Ghana. I always disagree when people say there are no jobs. There are jobs in Ghana. I don't know the kind of job people are looking for. But, I mean, once we have almost about 35 million uh, people living in Ghana, it means that there's a lot of things to offer in exchange for money. So our young guys out there, we should stop saying that there are no jobs. There are really jobs. Come to the village and you realize that people are taking as, as much as uh, almost 1,000 cities of job done within a week. If only you are ready to work. They make money. They make big money, just within a week. So I will encourage our young people in the city and our, our graduates to join us and to join what we are doing to make more foreign exchange for our country because our city can only change when we bring more foreign exchange so i'll take this opportunity to tell our young graduates the the ones that are yet to be graduated that as soon as you have your tools and your inputs, you don't have to relax. I mean, there's a time, there's a time to run to achieve whatever you desire to achieve. Let's now check out some international business stories.
Sports and it's time to bring you the second installment of Sports. The National Point kickboxing team is leaving no stone unturned in its preparation for the East Coast Classics which begin on October 8 in South Carolina in the United States. Joy Sports Asari Bidiyako was at the team's training center earlier today. <laughs> Eight Ghanaian fighters will be competing at a point kickboxing tournament which will be staged in South Carolina, United States in October this year. In point kickboxing, fighters win by points and not by knockout as is the case in main kickboxing. The sport is a combat one based on kicking and punching, historically developed from karate mixed with boxing. The national team is fine-tuning preparation for the East Coast Classics, which gets underway in two weeks. Ebenezer Echampon is the team's technical director. I think so far preparation is going very well and the guys are determined to get some medals uh, for Ghana as well. And we are pushing hard. You know, when it comes to combat uh, sports like this, you, you need discipline. So sometimes uh, the guys need someone that they, uh, they can respect very well. So you, you still have to push them, screen at them and keep them moving. They are well determined. Uh, some of them, uh, I, I would say all of them are determined to move forward because, you know, they know their background, they know where they are coming from and they know where they are getting to in the future. So they are well determined and they also they are, they are pushing hard to get medals for Madagana. Raman Anantoto, who fights in the 90 kg category, cannot wait for the championship to start. Like uh, one of the greatest uh, fighters says, you win the fight in the gym, <laughs> not the ring, okay? So it's the preparations. This one takes more of experience, tactics, the speed, you know, agility, the stamina, more than strength and energy, you know? We're not using power. The power is useless in this type of kickboxing because it's point. So you have to be, you know, very agile, you know, have a good stamina, be very fast, and then have a lot of tactics. You know, that's how you win it. So it's not about power. And uh, uh, in regards to that, we are very prepared. Like, we have a lot of tactics. To, uh, we know where to hit, where not to hit, how to hit, and how not to hit. Captain of the national team, Jonathan Iro, is happy mentoring the younger fighters in the team. Okay, well, you can see we, we have been in the system for so long a time. And the other fighter that is coming, you know, we have teach them a lot. So what I can say is, they should humble themselves so that we can teach them more. Because we, especially we need more fighters to come into what we are doing, so that we can teach more. We need more features, not only this, but we need more uh, fighters to to improve yourself. Yeah, well, as a fighter fighting as a point kickboxing, uh, the fight is all about points. We don't knock open it. So you, the trainer or let's say you the coach, you have to show or teach your, your fighter more techniques, speed work. You understand? That will make your fighter as a good fighter to win this fight, not to go there to knock your opponent, but especially the experience more. You have to be flexible, speed, a little bit power. But all your combinations will be like give and take. President of Point Kickboxing Ghana, Ahmed Ibrahim, believes the sport has a bright future. Point kickboxing, two years now in Ghana here, and most of the fighters have been know how to fight point now. They know uh, what is the stick and they know how it works. It's not like normal kickboxing. There is no too much injury. We use headgears and shin guard. So I can tell you that the future of point kickboxing is, is good because I can see most of the fighters are coming to join, uh, they are coming to join the, fight, the, the point kickboxing now. The likes of Richard Isidu, Isaac Komi, Edmond Akato, Selam Darko, Raman Anantoto, Alfred Ajate, Jerry Kwansa and Jonathan Hero are expected to win medals for Ghana at this year's East Coast Classics slated for October 8. Let's get you updates from the UEFA Champions League. And as you can see, Ajax Amsterdam beating Besiktas by two goals at 2-0 in their, their game. Shakhtar, um, Osko, um, Shakhtar Donetsk also playing goalers against Inter Milan. Paris Saint-Germain, big news. Lionel Messi scoring his first goal for PSG as they beat Pep Guardiola's Manchester City. RB Leipzig losing by two goals to one at home against Brugge. Porto. 
beaten five goals to one at home by Liverpool. And uh, we are doing stopping time in that game between AC Milan and Atletico Madrid. Atletico turning it around, leading by two goals to one at the San Siro. Dortmund also um, beating Sporting Lisbon by a goal to nil. And Real Madrid also losing um, to Sharif by two goals to one um, at home. Well, quite some really interesting results from the UEFA Champions League. I'll definitely do more later on at 10.30 p.m. on Fanzone. In the meantime, you can read more at myjoyonline.com forward slash sport. I'm Hans Mensando. And that's our package for tonight. Many thanks for your company. We have more stories when you log on to myjoyonline.com and we say to the legend, may you so rest in peace. My name is Ernest Mina. Hello, I'm Dori Nando. You can catch up with all the fun on the Cosmopolitan Mix and on all our shows via podcast. Just go to My Joy Online podcast and search for your favorite show and relive those moments all over again. Only on Joy 99.7 FM, radio for discerning listeners. Super